So uh, um, thank you all very much for uh, joining me. I, can you all hear me in the back? Yeah, is this okay? Because okay, good. Because I I don't like running around with microphones. Um, Aaron, thank you for that introduction. Um, a couple of personal notes. So I'm a Dutchman who got lost in the United States at some point in time. Um, I worked for 12 and a half years in Unity, for, of which three and a half years in Colombia, Bogota, at the time when Pablo Escobar was still alive. So if you've seen Narcos, uh, that series, I was in Colombia living at that time over there. Um, then lived in China for two and a half years, uh, then went to the Netherlands for 10 years, then came to the US, and now I am living in Singapore. My three boys are in the United States. The eldest is here, Conrad, um, in uh, University of San Diego. I have an 18-year-old in Chicago attending Northwestern, and a 16-year-old who lives in the family uh, house in uh, Minneapolis with, uh, with a guardian. And my wife and I, we travel um, all over the place. So that's personal introduction. Uh, rules of engagement, I would suggest that if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, it's more fun if you raise your hand and say, I don't agree with what you just said. Uh, that's also okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go really quickly through the presentation. I have a couple of slides, and then I'm going to open it up for questions, because it turns out that normally you know, the Q&A is much more engaging uh, than, than the slides. But we have to do a couple of slides in order to get you all grounded as to what's Cargill, and then what is it that I do in my capacity as the strategy leader for Cargill. So, Let's talk about Cargill for a moment. You may not, never have heard of Cargill. That's OK. Um, we are, by revenue, the largest private company in the world. We have something like $120 billion of revenue. That sounds like fantastic, but we are generating only $6 billion of EBITDA with that and $3 billion of profit. So depending on how you measure it, um, we are either the world's largest private company or a very big private company. It doesn't matter all that much. Um, we have about 100 private uh, shareholders. They are two families. Um, and we are in the seventh generation. Um, so the business was founded 150 years ago, and the business has been handed over from one generation to another. Um, management is entirely into the hands of professionals. There are some family members who sit on our board um, and who actually take part in the decision making. Uh, but we also have independent directors, uh, you know, who've been CEOs of significant American corporations. Um, this is what we do. And uh, you know this has a lot of fancy words, so you can read it, read it at your leisure. But let me just help you with a couple of very simple concepts. We buy uh, agricultural commodities in areas, countries where there is a surplus, and we take it to areas or countries where there is a deficit. So, for example, um, Argentina, Brazil have a massive surplus of soya beans um, and corn. We buy those soybeans. We put them in a grain elevator, then we put them in a rail car, then we put them in a boat, then we take them to the other side of the world, um, and you know we unload them and we get them to a customer in China or in Thailand or wherever that agricultural commodity is needed. So we have lots of physical assets to manage that flow of commodities around the world. If you have a very large presence in the physical flow of commodities, you tend to have a leg up on other market participants in terms of being able to estimate what's going to happen next in the market. So we tend to have an idea as to, well, maybe corn prices are going to go up, and then we will trade on that information. So we will go long, um, and you know, we generate extra income for our shareholders by trading, taking positions in global commodity markets. So the Kaggle DNA is, is deeply uh, embedded with, with trading uh, capabilities. Also, what we do is, as we move that stuff around, we transform it into other things. So, um, in the United States, I am told that on an average day, you will be eating a, um, or 32 times a day, a Cargill ingredient. That can be part of the oil that you have in McDonald's. It can be the bun, uh, the flour in the bun from McDonald's. It can be the patty in McDonald's. It can be the chicken McNugget. Um, it can be the sweetener that is in your Coca-Cola. So we have an enormous amount of food ingredients. And as a result of that, we have hundreds of manufacturing facilities around the globe. We also produce feed. Um, so some of those commodities we turn into stuff that you feed to animals. Um, and that is in increasingly becoming a very sophisticated business with lots of PhDs who understand what goes on in the, in the gut of an animal. And then we harvest animals. Um, that is a euphemism for we kill them. Um, so, you know, we have slaughtering facilities and we are one of the largest beef producers in the United States. We are a very large global producer of poultry, chicken. Um, so we're deep into meat, uh, protein. 
And then lastly, um, uh, around all that, we do financial services. So we have a couple of financial businesses. I am not just the strategy leader, but also the financial businesses report to me. Um, we generate loans for agricultural producers, but also corporates and countries around the world. And we sell those loans to banks. And in that, um, uh, or in those transactions, there is an arbitrage opportunity that we capture. Um, and we make a fair amount of money out of um, financial engineering. So that is our business. That is what we do. Um, and I hope that this clicker is going to, oh, yep. Competitive advantages. Um, I already talked about it. We have a global, we manage global supply chains. So on average, in an average year, we do 250,000 cross-border uh, shipments of agricultural commodities going from one country to another. Uh, 17,000 of those go by boat. Um, you know, that can be either one of these very big boats full of grain, it can be a smaller boat. Um, so we're deep into what goes on in the world of commodities around the globe. Then, um, secondly, we have deep expertise in food, um, agriculture, and risk management. So what is risk management? Risk management is basically coming down to make sure that you understand what your position is in global markets. Um, so that sounds, for, for those of you who are not, don't have experience with that, you know, if you're long or if you're short, especially if you're short in a market, you want to know at the end of the day how short you are. Um, because if you... You know, it turns out that you're bigger or you're shorter than you thought you were and, and markets actually increase, you can easily lose a billion dollars. So it is very, very important that around all those trading activities, you have very tight controls and systems that allow you to, at every point in the day, understand where you are and, um, uh, you know, manage your risk. One of the reasons why we are still around and others are not is because most companies over the last 150 years in our space have blown up. Um, you know, people trade, and it finds out, or it turns out that they have a big position, uh, markets go against them, boom, they're out of business. And Cargill has 150 years of very good risk management capabilities, um, and that's why we are still in, um, in business. We have uh, also deep expertise in um, um, research, so we know a lot about what goes on in an animal's gut. Um, I'm sure that you've read about the biome. Um, you know, your uh, genetic footprint is your own DNA, but it is also the bugs that live on you, and it is the bugs that live in your gut. The bugs that live in your gut have influence on your mental and physical well-being, um, and we have deep understanding of that, um, and that's where the whole business of feed is going. So increasingly, you know, you just don't give uh, your average cow a bag of feed. No, you actually increasingly know what that cow does the whole day. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to deploy uh, cameras that see whether or not a cow is eating and whether or not a cow is moving. And on the basis of that information, you can actually individualize feed and make sure that you have better outcome. Thirdly then, um, yeah, we're a truly global company. We are in 70 countries. Um, so we have touch points and we have, you know, lots of efforts going on to the digital space. Um, so yeah, we have a very large global footprint. A lot of our competitors will have a presence only in one country. Um, and then you're handicapped if you have to compete against cargo because, you know, we have both the origin and the destination and then we have everything in between. And that makes us a powerhouse. Um, four, we are privately owned. So we're not a public company. We don't have quarterly earnings calls. We don't have people, you know, activists. Not that there is anything wrong with activists. Um, you know, I, Sarah Lee, we had an activist on our board, Jeff Aben, who's from here from California. Um, I, you know, get along with Jeff great. I think he's fantastic. Uh, but we don't have any of that. We can just manage the company for the long-term health of the business. We don't have profit warnings, we don't have, you know, cuts in the um, organization because we have to hit our quarterly number, we can actually manage the company for the long term. Now that sounds great, but it also comes with enormous challenges. It's actually quite uh, helpful if you're a public company, because if you're a public company, you always have the pressure of the financial community around your neck. Um, and that means that something has got to get done. And that, you know, energy that creates of, of having to report your quarterly numbers and having to tell a good story is actually quite helpful. So one of the challenges that we have as an organization is how do we create burning platforms for change? 
We have a very strong balance sheet. Um, so we have a single A balance sheet. That's uh, you know where many banks are. You know some of the uh, stronger banks will have a double A balance sheet. Um, Nowadays, very few people have a triple A balance sheet, but we're very, very um, uh, strong balance sheet. Uh, and that allows us to engage in all sorts of transactions that people wouldn't want to contemplate with organizations that don't have a balance sheet like that. Our shareholders, of course, as private owners, say, it's great that you're playing with our money, but can you please stay within the boundaries of a single A rating? Um, because you know we have a goal as shareholders for value creation, but we also have a goal of value preservation. Um, and one of the metrics of value preservation, we've already talked about risk management. So we, we have to be very good at risk management in order to make sure that we don't massively create a problem for our shareholders, but we also have to have a very strong balance sheet so that they have comfort that, you know, not only um, are we, uh, you know, very well off, but also it's not going to all disappear tomorrow morning because the company is going bust. And then lastly, very, very importantly, um, is 150 years of ethical culture. So um, we talk about this a lot. I've been in multiple organizations. The belief system in Kaggle um, is not that you are an ethical organization because otherwise you're going to get in trouble. That's what most organizations think and communicate internally. You know, we have to be ethical because if we are not ethical, we're going to get in trouble. The belief system in Kaggle, the DNA of the organization says, we have to run our business in an ethical way. And if we do that sustainably, we will be more successful in the business uh, or competitively um, relative to other players. So we have deep belief that doing the right thing is always you know, the best long-term play. So in Kaggle, you know, people will tell stories. We build a $100 million plant. Somebody asked for a bribe of $1,000. We never paid that bribe of $1,000. The plant didn't operate for six months. Nobody cared because we don't play bribes. Um, we have supply chains of cocoa beans coming out of Ivory Coast. Um, people tell each other stories in Cargill that every competitor's truck gets stopped because everybody knows that, you know, um, if you stop a truck of a competitor of Cargill, you know, maybe you can get $10, $20. Don't stop the truck from Cargill because it'll just stand there and nothing will happen and it can stand there for a couple of days so our trucks just keep going. Um, so that's a, you know, a couple of examples of the belief system, we have to do the right thing. Which is not to mean that we always smell like roses. If you Google us, you know, you'll see you know, very critical articles. Maybe some of you have done that. We can talk about that. Um, you know, we're a very large organization, very public. Uh, we're not public in the sense that we have listed uh, um, shares, but we're pretty public. We're, we're always on the magnifying glass, and we believe in the notion that if you in a world where nothing can be hidden, you better have nothing to hide. So just make sure that everything you do you know, is actually ethical. Um, and what I've experienced over the last few years is that I come across a lot of people who will say, well, I like working for Cargill because I'm very comfortable that I will never get asked to do something that is at variance with my own ethical system. You hear that a lot in our organization. This all, by the way, sounds great. Um, we have massive challenges. Um, so we are too slow internally. We are. Our systems are outdated, so there's massive programs going on in order to modernize the company, all sorts of challenges that we have, but I'm just giving you the, um, you know, the short pitch as to why um, we're well positioned. Now, we are positioned for growth, um, and I'll start, you know, provide a little more of a balance. Uh, we're positioned for growth, but we're not growing fast enough. So one of the things that I'm trying to work on is, you know, how can we get the company into a mode of faster growth? Why are we well positioned for growth? Well, um, as you probably know, by 2050, the world population is likely to peak at around nine and a half billion people. Um, and um, an enormous amount of people, 2.4 billion people in the next 10 years will move into the middle class. As people move out of extreme poverty and move into the middle class, their diet changes. So people who are live in extreme poverty will normally um, very much depend on grains. They eat grains and rice. And as they move up the ladder of income, they start eating protein, they start eating more meat. And more meat means more animals that need to be fed, um, more meat animals that need to be raised. Um, so those are all business opportunities for us. So we are positioned to capture that because, you know, hopefully, a very large part of the world population is going to move into that um, middle class. 
Um, you obviously, or you will have heard that the agricultural output in the next um, 30 years needs to double. Uh, that's true. Yes, the world can do that. We have the resources. No, we don't have to cut forests in order to do that. You can feed um, 9.5 billion people by 2050, and you can do it in a way that is entirely sustainable. There's work to be done in order to get there, by the way, but you know, that's, if you do the math, that's doable. Um, why are we positioned for growth? Well, a um, couple of things, and I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but transparency, the block in the bottom left. Um, what's going on, big story in the world of food, is that increasingly consumers are asking questions about what I would call provenance of what is on their plate. Um, and provenance is a broad um, concept. So people say, can you please give me reassurance that there is no child labor in this production of this food? Can you please give me reassurance that this food is safe? Can you please give me reassurance that the farmer has been paid um, fairly? Can you please give me reassurance that there is no antibiotics in this food? Um, can you please give me reassurance that there is no deforestation going on in the production of this food? Their list is endless. And the common denominator of all of those reassurances is that our sensory capabilities are not capable of testing whether or not that is true. There is nobody in this room who can taste the difference between a cage-free egg and an egg that has been mass-produced. So for all of those attributes of assurance that people are looking for, you know, humans do not have an ability to test, either see, smell, or taste whether or not that's true, i.e., what does that mean? Increasingly, people are looking at insurance in deeper into the supply chain. Give me assurance as to what happened everywhere in that supply chain, all the way from the farm to the fork. And because we touch all of those um, points of the supply chain, we actually have some visibility. So let me give you an example. Our cocoa and chocolate business buys from a couple of million of farmers um, who, buy, who produce cocoa beans in Ivory Coast and Ghana. Um, every bag nowadays gets labeled with a label which we scan with a scanner. You know, it looks like a, yeah, one of these handheld scanners. We know from every bean which piece of land it comes from. We deploy artificial intelligence to try and figure out whether or not that is likely to be a piece of, piece of land where there is child labor. So we try and figure out which of the farmers actually have children so that we have some visibility on whether or not they are likely to deploy their children in their own farm. And then we will deploy things like satellite images in order to make sure that they don't deforest, uh, because that's you know, one of the things that consumers are asking for. So these things are very, very hard to do. Um, and that's part of the strategy that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, here is what we are playing for um, portfolio. We've already talked about growth. There are a number of businesses that we are in that are not going to grow. So let me give you an example, high caloric uh, sweeteners the stuff that goes into your Coca-Cola, at least if you don't drink Diet Coke. Uh, the sweetener, we provide the sweetener. Um, and the consumption of uh, um, uh, carbonated soft drinks in the United States is declining. And if you go into any American city, you say, that's a good thing, because obviously this country has a problem with obesity. Um, so you know, people cutting back on uh, um, high caloric sweeteners, that's actually a good thing. We are very big in that business, so that business is going to decline. Um, Americans eat 220 pounds of uh, meat every year. They are massive uh, beef eaters. Um, not likely that you're all going to eat even more beef. Um, and probably that may be a good thing. Um, so we are in a number of categories that are not growing. Um, these are the areas that we are trying to get into. Um, so we have to become bigger in Asia. We're going to go into seafood. So at some point in time, you're going to be buying a fish in um, Costco that comes from Cargill. Um, we're going to be further into protein, alternative protein. You've all heard about alternative or beyond meats and uh, impossible burger. Um, more health and nutrition, bioindustrials, and digital solutions, so digital business models that we are pursuing. Now, that's Cargill. Now quickly about corporate strategy. Uh, because I do three things for Cargill. I am the chairman for Asia Pacific, um, which basically means that I am trying to get convince Cargill that we need to grow faster in Asia Pacific. Um, nobody reports to me in that role. 
we have 57,000 people in Asia Pacific. We have a pretty significant business over there. And um, a year and a half ago, in the executive team, we said um, we need more executive representation in Asia. Um, who's willing to go? And I raised my hand and said, "Yeah, I'll go." Um, you know, I have lived in China. Um, Conrad over there was born in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I'll go. Um, so that sounds like a fun gig. And I gave up my CFO role and I went to Asia. And I am trying to drum up the system in order to do more in Asia. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, and then I am also the global strategy leader. Um, so we have about 120 people who do professionals like yourself, um, either with undergraduate degrees or graduate degrees, uh, MBAs from very good schools, uh, very accomplished people. A lot of them have background in ag, have some link to ag. Um, and um, uh, you know they are in our businesses, but they are all also in the corporate side about 120 professionals, um, many of them young people in their you know, late 20s, early 30s, um, and they are in that group that I help lead, and they are helping Cargill think through you know, where do we go. What is it that we want to be known for? First of all, strategy support. Um, we run an internal McKinsey, if you like. So with 120 people, well, we run an internal McKinsey, but we also run an internal investment bank. So we have you know, 30 deal makers whose life uh, is entirely making deals, buying companies, selling companies, restructuring, and then, you know, 90 to 100 uh, strategy professionals. Um, and we run a internal McKinsey. And we have to get better at making sure that we actually hit that level of the McKinsey's and the Bain's and the BCG's. Um, so that's upper left. Then portfolio shift. We're working as a team to convince the Cargill stakeholders, the family and the board and everybody in the building that, <coughs> come on, people, it's time to de-emphasize our presence in high caloric sweeteners. We got to go faster in health and nutrition. Let's go and buy a company that is more forward looking and that has better growth prospects uh, long term. So we're spending an enormous amount of our time trying to influence this enormous machine, this tanker. Uh, let's go and, and spend anywhere between 10 and 15 billion on newer areas that have better growth prospects. Looking around the corner, bottom middle. Um, so we're big now, or we're, we're becoming very visible in alternative protein. Um, soon you will be able to buy a burger that is, we think, better than the um, Impossible Burger. The Impossible Burger has a list of about 20 ingredients, ours has six. I tasted it last week, um, so we're getting in there. Um, we have invested in cultured meat, people who are trying to grow a steak from individual cells. Uh, we are investing in insects. We're investing in pea protein. That's the ingredient that goes into these alternative hamburgers. So we're all over it. Uh, but the reality is that we're sitting there and say, ah, you know, you should have seen that five years ago rather than three years ago. We were actually two or three years late in seeing that. So. One of the things that my strategy group needs to do is we need to think ahead and see what's coming around you know, uh, two, three years, five years from now that the business isn't yet concentrated on because it isn't hitting them yet, but it's out there and it will happen. So we're going to have a mechanism of making sure that all these people who are in this department will spend some part of their time trying to figure out what's out there. And you know, we'll make a list of you know, new ideas. Um, I have a bunch of them in my head. What's CRISPR going to mean for Cargill? What's um, artificial photosynthesis going to mean for our biofuel business? Uh, you know, it's easy to make a list. Let's go and study that, and let's then make sure that the Cargill system becomes sensitized to it. The um, one in the middle network is neural networking. We are a very diverse company, as you will have figured. You know, we're in feed and supply chains and food and ingredients and, and, and. And we're so large that, you know, often it becomes kind of hard to make sure the left-handed Kaggle knows what the right-handed Kaggle is doing. And because we are so diverse, you cannot be top-down. Um, you know, there's no way that somebody in my position actually has a deep understanding of everything we do. Uh, it's just physically impossible because we are in, you know, 15, 20 different industries. If you can keep up with two or three industries, that's a lot. There is no physical capability for anybody to keep up with 15 to 20 industries. So we have to be quite decentralized in our decision making, but we need to make sure that the left-handed cargo knows what the right-handed cargo does. And there are a couple of departments that actually see everything in the organization. So R&D is one of them, 
strategy is another one, corporate affairs is another one, and we're making sure that all those groups are starting to make sure that information flows. And I use often the metaphor of a flock of birds. You know, flocks of birds, they can fly beautifully in formation, and there is nobody who is the CEO. There isn't anybody who says, you know, I'm the CEO, we're going to go left. No, they have a neural networking capability to make sure that they all fly information, and that's what we need to emulate. And then lastly, practitioners, a lot of the people that we hire spend a couple of years in the department and then they go on and you know, run parts of cargo functions or businesses. There are about 100 uh, alums in the department who, um, um, uh, who have uh, significant managerial roles. Quickly then, what is it that we're currently working on strategy? Um, we have, I'm going to do this real quick. Portfolio shifts we've spoken about. We've spoken about geography, the importance of Asia. We can discuss that further. I just want to talk about the two on the left. First of all, integrity of food supply chains. So one of the things that we're working on as a strategy department is we're trying to convince the Cargill system that we need to fundamentally rethink um, our frame of mind around sustainability. And for a lot of Cargill businesses, it still very much sits into the license to operate domain oh shit, we got to do this because if we don't do this, we're going to get ourselves in trouble and somebody is not going to be willing to buy from us anymore and therefore we may have to attend to the sustainability requirements. We, are, um, uh, we have committed to adhere to the Paris Agreement, um, you know, massive uh, complex uh, complexity that generates, uh, but it sits for a lot of parts of our business still in, uh, yeah, that's kind of really hard, but we got to do it because otherwise we're going to get ourselves in trouble. And we need to get it out of the domain of license to operate, and we need to get it into the domain of this could well be the single biggest opportunity on which we sit. So in my old role, I've been responsible for cutting hundreds of millions of costs out of the system. It's all great, and by all means, go and do that. But my view is that if you really want to double the profits of cargo, that's the button that you should push. Um, and why? Well, very simple. I've explained to you already all of the concurrent requirements that consumers and customers are putting on supply chains. It's <coughs> really, really hard to do it, and it will create barriers to entry. There is going to be a day soon where the Unilevers of the world who make Magnum, um, everybody know the Magnum, the ice cream, you know, the chocolate ice cream or the chocolate cover, will say, whoa, 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 this chocolate, we can only buy that from Cargill or Barry Callabout or Olam, you know, three reputable companies, because if we buy it from any Tom, Dick and Harry, we can blow our entire brand up on a food safety issue or a child labor issue that can pop up in any newspaper. Um, so we better stick with those three suppliers. Once we're there, those three suppliers will become significantly more profitable. Just to give you an idea about how the math works, so we have 120 billion in revenue. Let's say that we could increase our prices by 2% as a result of that. Very modest increase, that's 2 billion. 2 billion is 33% uh, more EBITDA and it is actually, uh, on an after-tax basis, a 50% increase in our profit. And 2% of our ingredient price increases, you won't find it back in the store. You know, typically, if you calculate that through what it means for the consumer, it's like half a percent or less than 1%. So that 2% that hopefully will come out of decommoditization of our supply chains will help us become massively more profitable. And that's why we're spending a lot of time trying to convince the organization, hey, this is not one of these many things that we have to attend to. This is a massive business opportunity. Let's go and run it, or let's go and run after it. And then the next one, disruption. The agricultural industry is an industry that is very used to gradual disruption. Um, so, uh, or gradual change, not disruption, gradual change. So, I don't know whether you've ever studied it, but the yield of corn uh, farmers in the United States tends to increase by 2 to 3% per year. So after the Second World War, you know, um, farmers became more and more productive, and the amount of corn that they produce out of an acre you know, increases by 2 or 3% per year, and that's been going on forever, and everybody assumes that it will go on for the next 30 years. And now all of a sudden there are people out there who say, no, 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 I can you know, triple the yield. Um, so if you look at vertical farming, for example, um, people who grow uh, uh, vegetables in, in vertical farms, they all of a sudden have increases. Of, they are all of a sudden like 10 times as productive as the traditional sector as they use 90% less water. And so there is real disruption coming to our industry. Just imagine what it would do to a meat supplier if you were all going to eat cultured meat, you know, meat that is 
grown in a, you know, currently still very much in a lab environment, a small scale production, but it's from cells you grow a meat. You don't grow an animal anymore because why would you grow an animal? Actually growing an animal in order to make a steak is a very inefficient thing because you get stuck with a hide and, you know, intestines and all sorts of stuff that you really don't want. J just grow the steak. Um, that's coming to our industry. So what we're trying to do as a strategy leadership group is we have a modest objective. Um, basically what we have said is we don't have to get it right by September when we present the new board, uh, the new strategy to the board. We just have to put everybody's hair on fire. Um, we just have to get people to say, oh shit, we better pay attention to this because it's finally going to happen. And what you see in our industry is over the last 10 years, an enormous amount of venture capital money has flown into the ag sector. All of a sudden, ag is very sexy. Uh, here in California, people are pouring billions and billions of dollars in ag startups, and the new products are now coming up. Um, so that's what we are working on. And there, I'm going to stop. I have now done, I think, half an hour. Good.